If you want to be a great developer, mastering tools that streamline your workflow, boost your productivity, and save you time is essential. As we start the new year, here are my top five daily tools that I use for working smarter and faster. The first tool that we're going to be covering today is called warp.dev. Now, warp is a modern terminal, a terminal for developers that reimagines the command line experience. Warp is a terminal I use for all my daily tasks, all my daily projects, all my daily everything that is associated with a terminal. I have some favorite features in this that I'd like to show you that really enhances my workflow. Now, one of the things I really love about the modern user experience that Warp offers is let's assume that I want to paste in a command. And as part of this command, I need to edit this API key. Usually you'd have to essentially navigate with your arrows to get the data that you need. In this case, you can literally just edit this line of text in line, pass in your API key, and it's just as simple as that. How time saving is this? It's amazing. It's, it's really amazing. It's so simple. It's so needed. Warp is a genius, a genius. The other thing I love about the Warp UI is the auto suggestions that it gives you. Let's assume I want to run a Docker container. Docker, I type it in, and as you can see, straight off the bat, it's already suggesting a previous command that I could have run. And in this case, if I press the right arrow, I accept it and then I can press enter and run it. But what if I want to uh, try and run another Docker container, but one that I've run previously? Well, if I just press the up arrow, it actually shows you a history of the commands that you've run. And it also suggests some other commands that you might run, like Docker images or Docker PS. In this case, I want to run Docker PS and I run it and it says, oh no, the Docker daemon is not running. And I'm like, oh yeah, I need to actually run Docker. But how do I run Docker? What's the command for it on uh, the terminal? And as you can see, it already auto suggests the command. It says sudo systemctl star docker. Well, I'm just going to press the right arrow, accept it, and I can run it. The other thing I really love about the UI is the customization part. And I think it's quite fun. If you go into settings and then you go into your appearance and you want to change the theme, you have so many of these themes available, something like uh, a typical kind of terminal style, or you can have uh, really cool backdrops of like a city, whatever suits your fancy. Is, is, that, how, is, that, is, that, is that what you say? Is that what you say? Uh, or you can just create your own theme from an image. How cool is that? The other thing that they have in the settings, which I really, really like, is the keyboard shortcuts. You can create your own keyboard shortcuts for literally anything that you want. Uh, they have all the things you can do within the terminal and you can just create your own shortcuts for it. I think if you're really looking to enhance your workflow and do things your way, which I feel a lot of people really like doing when it comes to terminal work, you have the full flexibility here. And I love that. Flexibility is king. And I love Warp for being flexible. Now, the next thing is what really blew my mind about Warp when I actually first saw this feature and uh, it just... I mean, it was just so helpful. And it's the AI integration that they have. Now I simulated, to, for, for demonstration purposes, all right? I simulated a very basic project under this path. Uh, if I press LS, that's to list the files I have in this folder, you can see I have package.json and server.js. And let's have a look what's inside server.js. And as you can see, it's already auto-suggesting to me, what should I do? And if I print it, you'll see that I have a very basic server file where I, you know, I use Express and I run my app and I send a, a hello AI debugger and listen on port 3000. Now, the cool thing is that now it's suggesting that I should run this server. And I also have a, uh, essentially a package.json. If we uh, look at the package.json, you'll see that the package.json has no dependencies installed. So if I go ahead and I'll write, uh, so not write, run <laughs> node, uh, node server.js, you'll see that we don't have a dependency, we, well, so we can't run it. And what Warp is doing in this case is it's, it understands the code I have in my file and it's suggesting, hey, actually, you know what? You are missing a dependency. So run npm install express, install the dependency, and then you'll be able to run your server. So essentially you can see the auto suggestion for npm install express. I'm going to go ahead and do that. It will go ahead and install express. Now Warp doesn't only use AI to find faults and help you fix them, but it also shows you and predicts the next step of a multi-step process. In this case, now it's telling me, okay, so now 
now run noserver.js and that server is running and I can just go ahead and access this site. Command, click, and there you go. Hello AI debugger. The second developer tool I use every single day is Notion. Notion is my go-to tool for planning and organizing everything I do. Notion combined with Google Calendar literally knows my whole day. That's how much I use it. It keeps everything in one place and literally has been my second brain this year. And it will definitely continue to stay as my second brain uh, during this upcoming year. Here is what I love about Notion and why I am so hyped about it. Notion AI. Oh, I love the AI world. It's so exciting. Now Notion AI is essentially a powerhouse for productivity. Whenever I need to generate pages or create a content outline, it's got me covered. As a web developer, I also rely on it to check my code and streamline my workflows. Now, here is an example of what makes Notion AI so useful for me. Here you can see that I have a code snippet written in Erlang. Now this code snippet spawns multiple processes to compute the factorial of a number concurrently. No easy feat. Well, now I'm going to ask Notion to translate this for me because I don't understand Erlang, I'm a JavaScript guy. So I wanted to write it in JavaScript for me. I can just click on the snippet here and ask AI, or I can just click on the very cute Notion face right here, the AI face. I wanna ask about this page and I can say, uh, please translate the code snippet into JavaScript for me. And as simple as that, essentially it understands that we're talking about this page. It's taking uh, the code here in Erlang and it's create a compute function that will calculate uh, the factorial of a number, as you can see. If I just close this, you'll see that it does a compute function and it calculates the factorial. So it works and it translates the code. Great. Now Notion is extremely good at polishing the content that you might have, organizing your outlines. It can rewrite text, suggest revisions, correct spelling mistakes, and so on. And I have a very important note that I've taken here. I watched a video about picking and harvesting carrots and I wrote it down. Now the video was very fast, so I made a bunch of spelling mistakes, I didn't format it properly, and I also should add more details about the aftercare of picking carrots. Now, I'm not sure how to go about it, I want it to be done fast, so I can ask the Notion AI to do it for me. Uh, please correct my grammar and spelling mistakes. Please organize the, oh, organize the page into a structured format. And I'm also making mistakes here. Structured format. And add more detail about the aftercare of picked carrots. Let's go. The AI has written exactly and structured everything as, I, as it should. Now, what I can do is I can essentially insert this here. So it takes everything that I've written, and I can now delete this, and here, blah, 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 getting ready, steps for picking carrots, and for the aftercare section, I would suggest adding information about cleaning and harvesting carrots, proper storage methods, and how to preserve freshness. Look at that. And that has all been done by the AI. Now, as a little bonus, I don't know if you know, but I've always loved the Notion art style. It's something that always kind of appealed to me whenever I use Notion or have been on their page. Now, Notion now released something called Notion Faces, and you can essentially just create your own face of yourself with the Notion graphics and the Notion art style. Uh, well, what am I going to say? Let me just, let me just show you. <laughs> and you can just export that and use it as your profile picture. I have mine, I love it, uh, so you should definitely check it out. Notion in general is a tool you can start using for free, so I don't see why you shouldn't. If you want to use all the AI features, it's like 10 bucks per month. And if you want to create your own face, just make sure you follow the link in the description. The next tool I use, especially for my prototyping work, getting a concept into place very, very quickly, is Tailwind CSS. Now Tailwind CSS, I'd say it's a tool and it's also a CSS framework that allows you for very rapid development. That means that instead of writing your typical CSS classes or your SAS classes and building the structure of that CSS, here you can include all your styling in line in your HTML or your React JSX. Uh, and as part of that, it allows you to 
essentially use the predefined, already pre-built classes that you just need to remember and write them out and understand the concepts and suddenly you can very, very quickly uh, create very modern, very beautiful UI designs. Now I really meant it when I said quickly and I'm going to prove the point right now. So watch me design this page. Now I've got a very simple Next.js project that just renders a very basic page. I'll show you the page, nothing fancy. It just renders hello tailwind on a black screen. Now, how do we turn this and make it a little bit nicer in a very short period of time? Well, let me show you. Now I have a div here and an h1 tag inside of it. Now this div has a class name and this h1 tag has a class name. And inside of these class names is where we're going to be entering the names of the pre-built styling that Tailwind offers. Now I wanna position my text in the middle. So I'm going to say position flex, uh, items, center, justify center uh, min h of screen and if we go back to the page you can see now it's already positioned in the center and uh, now let's give it a bit of background so let's say uh, background a gray of like 100 and now let's actually change the text because once we change the text you won't be able to see it because it's white so let's make it bigger and let's change the color of it uh, so i go back here i go into the class names of h1 and i say okay text let's give it a size of free excel um let's make it bold and let also give it a text color uh blue of like 500 and we go back to the page. And as you can see, we have a beautiful tailwind text in the middle of the screen. It's all positioned. And you can see how quickly I have done that. So once you know your tailwind, you can really, really quickly develop websites, do your prototyping, and just be a good developer. You're welcome. Now the fourth tool that I'm going to maybe introduce to some of you today, maybe you already know it, is called Excalidraw. And I can't imagine not having it by my side to do my design process, to do my prototyping. Excalidraw is essentially an open source tool that allows you to create hand-drawn diagrams and sketches, which is essentially, for me, ideal for prototyping, brainstorming, and most essentially visualizing what I had in my mind. So let me show you what it looks like and let me show you how to use it. Well, this is what Excalidraw looks like, and it's pretty self-explanatory, really. It's almost like working in paint in some respect. You've got a bunch of tools at the top and essentially the idea is that you create a little box and inside this box you can click and write something. Uh, this might be your user story or something else and then you might have the user come up to a next step which we'll call uh, step uh, number two, not pound two but number two. Uh, we can just position that in the middle here and then we can have another step. Let's make it a fancy little thing and inside this I'm going to say hello. Uh, and then we can have another one on a circle and the user user completes their journey. And then you can have arrows connecting these together and it just makes the design process super, super, super nice. And you can have maybe arrows connecting and lines connecting in between and you can have this one go back to here. And then the great thing is you can also annotate the lines like so. So realistically, it it's very easy. And of course, you can change the colors and, you know, obviously make it look all nice and fancy. Um, but realistically, this is just a really nice tool for being able to create everything like Everything that's in your head, you just put down essentially on the digital paper. You can access it anywhere. You can collaborate live with others. So both of you can be working on the same thing at once. And really, it's just a really nice reference for anything that you plan. So I highly recommend that you guys use it. I don't think I need to explain anymore. And the final tool in my top five is Postman. Oh my God, the amount of people that don't use Postman, that haven't heard about Postman, and that are just so unfamiliar with the tool, it seems crazy to me, because it's like part of my daily arsenal. Whenever I'm working on any project that involves any use of API, which at this moment in time, especially in web development, is pretty much every time, I just can't imagine not having it by my side. Postman is a powerful API and development testing tool. You can literally put your endpoint in there, put your uh, data in there that you're sending over and inspect it in a very nice and visual way. See what's coming back to you. See why it's not working. See the errors. It's just so useful. For this example, we're going to be using the holiday API and we're going to work with an endpoint called Workday, which calculates the workday that occurs a given number of days after a specific date. Now, this is the API endpoint that we're going to be working with. 
And if I go into Postman, this is Postman for you, or for the people that have never used it or never seen it. And as part of Postman, you can create a new request. And this is going to be a GET request because that's what we're getting. We're getting data. This is going to be the endpoint that we're working with. And as we can see from this example, we need to pass in specific parameters. And we need to pass in our key, which is our API key. We need to pass in the country, the start date, and the number of days after that date that we want to calculate. Now, this is my API key. Now, all of these have to be passed in as params. So within Postman, you have an authorization tab where you can essentially pass the type of authorization you're using. In this case, it's asking us to pass it as a key in the parameters. So that's what we're going to do. Then we're going to select a country. In this case, it's going to be Great Britain. That is where I live. Uh, we're going to pass in the start date, which has to be, from what I remember, in this type of format. So in the format of year, month, date. So let's do that. Today is 2024, January 06. And I, the other parameter is called days. And this is the number of days after this date that I want to know the day of the week for. So I'm going to say uh, 205 days after the 6th of January, give me the day. And I'm going to send this request. And as you can see, well, there you go. It comes out to be a Wednesday. Amazing. But if I got anything wrong, let's say I didn't provide a specific parameter that is required for this API to work, as you can see, the API gets back to you and you can see the error. The day's parameter is required, blah, blah, blah. If I don't provide the key, you'll see that, oh, the API key parameter is required and it's missing and it's a 401, so unauthorized. So you get a lot of insight here. You can also see all the headers. You can pass in a body, such as, for example, a raw text body. If you need to pass in like some JSON data, you can also do that. Uh, name Philip, for example, something like that. Uh, so there is a lot of flexibility you can have here for working with APIs. And I'm going to end it here. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please let me know down below what type of tools you use for your daily workflow and tools that are essential to you and how you use them. Make sure to like and subscribe to this channel because why wouldn't you? And as always, I'll see you in the next video.